Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I am Dr. Saurabh Dikshit and I hope you all have given the INICT. So whatever will be the results, that is one thing. But we should be knowing the important questions which came and do you know there were a lot of different questions coming from different resources. So don't worry about the results. If you have given INICT and if you, be, if you are a successful uh, candidate in INICT, that's great. And if you are not, then you have the need. And these questions can always be taken as a reference for your revision, for your need PG also. And the students who have actually given INICT, they should be knowing whether or no these questions, the answers they have marked was up to date or no, what is the, what are the correct answers for these questions. So let us understand the concepts. So this is a recall first of all let me tell you I have taken this recall from various resources which are available in online media and uh, whatever offline you can I, I, we can collect it from the students but let us let me uh, tell you that it may be not an exact representation of the MCQ but yes more or less they have been taken from the students who have given so I have tried to do the best compilation I could have done. So in total I could have I, I, I collected around 15 uh, sorry. 30 questions, approximately 30 questions that I have collected. Let us try to understand. The these majority of these questions were strictly basic and basic oriented. There was nothing like a very hi-fi question, but yes, it's a very important uh, exam. So all of had an eye on the exam related questions. Again, once again, the general surgery was very heavy. So there was a question regarding the damage control surgery. As you know, that damage control surgery is an abbreviated form of surgery where we control the damage, we don't correct the damage, we control the damage first. Then we send the patient for resuscitation. So if you talk about the phase one, the phase one of any damage control surgery is the laparotomy that you do. And what is so special about this laparotomy? This is an abbreviated form of laparotomy. So we go for an abbreviated laparotomy. In this, what are the two things that you are going to do? The first thing that you are going to do is control any ongoing bleeding. So if there is any ongoing bleeding, you are going to control that. The second thing that you are going to do is you are going to control the what? Contamination. So how do you control the contamination? This is one very simple thing. You can control the contamination by giving a thorough lavage and putting the drains. You know we don't go for the permanent closure. We go for a temporary closure and then comes the phase 2. The phase 2 of the patient is in the ICU and what are you doing here damage control has been done but now you have to make the patient physiologically also stable you know lethal trite there is something which is known as lethal trite because of the ongoing injury there's a physiological damage which results in acidosis hypothermia and coagulopathy so when the patient is taken to ICU the aim is to go for resuscitation you go for resuscitation and then we go for phase 3 when we talk about phase 3, what are the important things? This is the phase where you go for definite surgery. So, what are the things that we do? We do resuscitation, yes. We do decontamination, we do hemorrhagic control. But remember, as a part of damage control surgery, we are not going to do any vascular anastomosis. This will be done as a part of definite surgery. So, those who have marked C, that is the right answer for this. So, when we talk about neurogenic shock, what is the concept of neurogenic shock? This is what is very, very, very simple thing. Neurogenic shock is a state when there is central sympathetic failure. So central sympathetic, sympathetic failure is there. And whenever there is central loss of sympathetic tone, there will be something which is known as peripheral vasodilatation and therefore the pooling of blood will be there. So there will be hypotension, there will be hypotension and along with that there will be loss of sympathetic tone so bradycardia so bradycardia hypotension and bradypnea they are the classical features so hypotension and bradycardia are classically seen in this case next is there was a question on the x-ray given for uh, you can say uh, sigmoid volvulus this is a very 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 famous question that i have been already always been discussing just see so this is a very old uh, you can say slide of mine where i used to discuss the flash card it's available on youtube and a lot of uh, platforms where i teach so this is a very same question which i have been discussing and if you see we got a similar question the x-ray showing 
a sigmoid volvular. So again, the question is, I always uh, stress on a point how to identify whether it's a sigmoid volvulus. You can see a classical coffee bean appearance. Coffee bean appearance. That is one thing that you know. Or you can see an omega sign. You can see an omega sign. Or you can see a bent inner tube. So this is the outer part of the tube. And this part is the inner tube. So you can say this is what is a classical bent. This is a classical bent inner tube sign. Inner tube sign. But I am more interested in few important things. What are they? Let us try to understand. So when we talk about any volvulus, the first thing that I lay emphasis on, look at where is the apex. So apex is very, very, very important. Remember, in case of sigmoid volvulus, the apex is towards the right upper quadrant. Remember, as the sigmoid volvulus grows inside, this may even grow to left upper quadrant. So right to left is a shift when we see a large or a huge sigmoid volvulus. The second thing is, you get to see one line. So if you see here, I will show you something. So there is one line converging down. There is another line which is converging down. And there is one more line converging and fusing. So three lines fusing into one another. This is known as a Freiman Dahl sign. So a classical orientation of a sigmoid volvulus is towards the right upper quadrant. Whereas a cecal volvulus, cecal volvulus is having the apex towards the what? The left upper quadrant. Then here you can see the two air fluid levels. So two air fluid levels are classically seen. Whereas in cecal volvulus, you get to see a single air fluid level. So it's an easy question. And sigmoid volvulus is the answer for this. Next is there was a question on this mass the following. I don't know whether all the options are right or no. But yes, this time we had a lot of match the following questions. So how do you go for the lesions and how do you approach them in diagnosis? So when we th talk about thyroid, you know, USD guided FNAC is the gold standard. Why it is USD guided? Why it is USD guided? The answer is simple, very simple. You know, majority of the thyroid nodules may be a mixture of, you can say, solid and cystic. Solid is the tumor part, cystic is the necrotic, you can say, degenerate part. So if you go for a blind FNA, blind FNA is going to increase the risk of false negative reporting. So there could be a possibility when you aspirate it from a cystic part and then you give a report that it's a colloidal degenerative swelling and then you ask the patient to go for observation. After three months, the patient comes with pulmonary or liver metastasis. So it's very important you go for FNAC. Why we don't go for true cut? Because you know that liver, uh, thyroid is a very vascular organ. It's a vascular cascade. And also malignancy is having internal vascularity. So if it starts to bleed, the pretracheal fascia which is enclosing the thyroid will have a tension compartment developed because of which there will be impede or you can say there the vascular return from the organs will be impeded and thus the return from even the larynx will be impeded resulting in laryngeal edema and respiratory distress and that is why you know post total thyroidectomy a patient presents to you with sudden respiratory distress in the ward what to do you you go for emergency bedside exploration of the wound and evacuation of the hematoma the answer is not because the hematoma is compressing the trachea it is because of hematoma the venous return from the larynx is impeded and this results in laryngeal edema so Thyroid, you know, breast, the best and you can say the gold standard is the true cut biopsy, true cut biopsy. Then when we talk about the lymph node, the lymph node has excision biopsy and the marzolin ulcer or it was marzolin ulcer or a sarcoma, we go for a wedge biopsy or a shave biopsy. So to confirm it and then we can plan out an excision. So this is what is the best thing that we have. So thyroid, USG guided, breast, true cut, excision biopsy for lymph nodes. Even marzolin ulcers also, if it is a small, we can go for excision biopsy. But seeing the context of this question and the options available, I would have suggested this sequence of the answer. Next is, drug of choice before thyroidectomy, uh, before we go for thyroidectomy for a goiter to reduce this bleeding. Now, this is here, it's a bit controversial question. It can be potassium iodide as well as PTU. Remember, the, the concept of the drugs is not to reduce the bleeding. The concept of the drug is to attain a euthyroidic status. So remember, yes, to achieve the euthyroid status, I would have said carbimazole or methyl, uh, you can say methimazole would have been good. But here if you see, in order to shrink the function of the gland, KI would have been the ideal option. That is the Lugol's iodine. I hope you know about the Wolf-Chakoff effect. 
stimulatory and negative or inhibitory you can say stimulus to the gland so this is where i would have gone for a as an option now there was a question whether uh, an old lady fell down and she developed a head injury and there was an image given and I, if this was the image which I have collected from the student so this is suggestive of SDH how it is SDH you can see the shape it's a concavo convex shape the question was that she develops headache and neurological symptoms few days after so lot of clinical hints are given SDH you know elderly patients with uh, presentation of symptoms maybe few days later it may be acute on chronic SDH also in certain cases what is the source of bleed so as you know that in SDH the source of bleed is the middle meningeal artery no it is the bridging cortical veins so try to understand this is dura this is the skull and uh, this is dura and this is arachnoid and in between the dura and the arachnoid there are a lot of vessels and whenever there is trauma you know the dura and skull are fixed but arachnoid is not fixed so it's vigorously shaken and that is the time when the veins which are weaker than arteries and the veins in between the or you can say the vessels in between the skull and the dura and the arachnoid that is the bridging cortical vessels they tend to tear off and that is the time when the bleeding shall start and this is why it is bridging cortical vessels when we talk about vessels amongst them veins are thinner and that is why it is bridging cortical veins which are the most probable answer in this case next is there was a sequence based uh, arrangement on uh, in the RTA this is again a recall based question again it's a controversy why because try to understand the primary survey and the resuscitation they are done simultaneously so primary survey and the resuscitation are done simultaneously so here this is the sequence I would have gone for C as the first thing and then when you talk about primary survey first we have to go for airway so secure airway secure airway and then stabilize the C spine however you have to understand that this order is not always you can say a dictum if you have any catastrophic bleeding you could have stopped the bleeding first so then we follow the order of c a b c d e so remember here c then b then a would have been the probable answer providing the options which are given here however you have to understand that resuscitation and primary survey are done simultaneously next is vitamin b12 deficiency is a feature of you know there is something which is known as castle's intrinsic factor which is produced by stomach so remember it is seen with stomach also it is absorbed in duodenum and jejunum so here also even some part of it is absorbed in duodenum the least would be affected in case of d so if it is ileal resection if it is ileal resection if you go for a total ileal resection then also you will see this but remember ileal resection is the answer of exclusion in this case the next is a patient referred from outside with acute necrotizing pancreatitis with collection on CT scan. So this is a necrotizing pancreatitis and the patient is on vasopressor. Remember the patient is on vasopressor. That means patient is really sick and otherwise if you use your common sense if the patient would have not been sick and sinking patient would have not been referred. So forget about anything you can do surgically. The first thing is try to do a percutaneous aspiration under the USG so that you can remove the underlying you can say contaminated content so C would be the best answer remember necrosectomy would have been done only once the patient is hemodynamically stable remember already CT has given you the dimensions of the you can say or the extent of the loss that you are having so it's pointless that you go for this MRI right now so this is what is very 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 important then there was a question on birats I couldn't recall the question because the students were not giving have not shared the image I hope you know birats is breast imaging reporting and data system and birats what is birats birats lyrats tyrats pyrats this is a way of expressing in terms of radiology how close the lesion that you are seeing resembles with a malignancy so birats zero is inconclusive that you cannot conclude so repeat therefore you need to repeat so therefore repeat scan repeat scan or 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 alternate scan you need to change the scan so alternate scan the second is birats one birats one is negative that means there is nothing inside what is birats two the lesion that you are talking about is definitely benign so in these cases you need to go for nothing but an annual follow-up annual follow-up 
when you go for birad 3 this is actually written as probably benign so when we talk about probably benign what is the probability of it being benign of be, it being malignant less than 2% risk of malignancy and that is why these are the patients where we go for 6 monthly scan follow up scan then you have birads 4 which is suspicious so when we talk about suspicious we need to know what should be the suspicion risk 2 to 95 percent risk of what there is malignancy so if you talk about uh, the other things we have 4a 4a which is 2 to 10 percent 4b is more than 10 up to you can say 50 percent and 4c is more than 50 up to 95 percent then students we have something which is known as birads 5 this is suggestive and when we talk about suggestive how much suggestion we need so suggestive means suggestive means more than more than 95 percent remember in both of these cases you need to go for biopsy has to be done what is birad 6 birad 6 is a case scenario where already you know the diagnosis suppose you are going for bct in invasive ductal cancer so you need to repeat the scan to be assured that whether there is no lesion in the contralateral breast or in the same breast there is no other hidden lesions so if you are doing the scan for biopsy proven biopsy proven ca breast so biopsy proven ca breast if it is there then you categorize that as birad 6 then there was a question one more question from bcs it's a straightforward question from i have been discussing it for long time yes history of prior radiation is a contraindication remember active sle active sle active scleroderma active scleroderma so active sle active scleroderma remember multiple tumors is a relative remember tumor less than 4 cm size less than 4 cm size this is not a contraindication neither is the d large breast i don't know whether the recall is correct or no so both b and d are not the contraindications for bcs remember breast conservation can surgery can be done however technically in large breast it becomes a bit difficult so i would have said either the recalls are not good but yes tumor less than 4 cm and d large breast both are uh, not a contraindications for this so alcohol based sanitizer must be used after uh, must not be used in uh, examining the patient in what case scenario if this was a question with visible soiled hands so if the hands are soiled you need to wash it so you will not be using the alcohol based the sanit alcohol based sanitizer for this purpose so there was a question direct question from doctrine of Munro kelly i've been teaching it for a very long time now and i'm very happy that this year i got a question you know doctrine of Munro kelly says skull is a closed vault any addition to it is managed by egress of csf in venous blood and it is given as a beautiful equation that cpp is equal to map minus icp so there could be a question on whether the map is given whether cpp is given and icp is asked or icp is given they ask for cpp so this was a very straightforward simple question then there was a question on visible mass in the epigastric region so remember it is cct based assessment or i don't know what were the, this was the recall so there was a visible mass in the ct on epigastric region with the cd117 positive so this is a very strong marker for just because lymphomas are positive for s100 it could be but not for cd117 so yes this is a gastric gist probably probably it's a gastric gist it's a very 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 simple question i hope you know gist is gastrointestinal stromal tumor and the stomach is the most common site of this what are they they are the smooth muscle tumor arising from the interstitial cells of kazal however they are not exactly the smooth muscle tumors next is not used to diagnose breast cancer radiology yes is very important because radiology will help you in localization biopsy will help you in confirmation and clinical examination will help you in assessment of this remember this together forms the concept of what triple assessment and this is what is very 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 important when we talk about pet ct pet ct is used for metastatic workup of any cancer 
so remember when we talk about pet ct it's very obvious that we use the pet ct for metastatic workup metastatic workup so it's very 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 simple simple for us to understand so answer is a a is not question uh, the uh, option that is correct so when we talk about the sirs what is sirs systemic inflammatory response syndrome so when you talk about systemic inflammatory this is a very 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 famous throw away level of question systemic inflammatory response syndrome what are the things that you need to understand students it has four parameters that the heart rate is more than 90 per minutes respiratory rate is less than uh, is more than 20 per minutes or remember because of this increased respiratory rate there may be what pacu2 less than 30 or 32 mm hg along with that what else do you get to see temperature of the body more than 38 so both hyper or hypo less than 36 degree celsius and then wbc count more than 12000 or 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 more less than 4000 per mm cube so remember respiratory rate is important pulse rate is important uh, temperature is important but sbp is not a parameter that is included here then there was a question on pneumothorax and there was a question on what should be done so yes a stab injury with a patient of pneumothorax we would have gone for intercostal uh, chest drain insertion now in this case we need to assess whether this pneumothorax the the question was that there was a very simple question i couldn't get the complete things if this is a pneumothorax that the first line management or the treatment of choice would have been a classical intercostal chest drain insertion if it would have been a tension pneumothorax then also the same if it would have been a tension pneumothorax with unstable patient you know intercostal chest drain should be done but before that decompression with the what needle so needle thoracostomy followed by tube ultimately tube would have been done same there was a question on the boundaries of triangle of safety so i will discuss that later so gas under the diaphragm again is a straightforward question if you see my last predictable series of top 15 questions most predictable the first question that i have asked was a peptic ulcer disease question so gas under the diaphragm what is the next thing answer is we need to go for laparotomy so laparotomy is what we need to do this is the definite uh, you can say treatment of choice but however try to understand what is the you can say what will you do next so if you have a patient with gas under the diaphragm the first thing that you need to do is the stabilize resuscitation of the patient because if it is hemodynamically unstable you cannot take the patient for the surgery so first resuscitation and followed by surgery so a followed by c would have been an answer because in INICT is known for its you can say confusing character of the question so this is a very easy question but yes what should be ne then next if you have a patient of gas in the diaphragm you cannot say ki, okay chalo, let's directly take him to ot first you have to give some fluid stabilize the patient then you have to take so this is what is the answer a followed by c benefit of laparoscopy you know i am a laparoscopic and robotic surgeon so i always 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 condemn any form of open surgery the first thing is the best cosmesis not better the best cosmesis it's painless why it's painless i will tell you because there are very less incisions made over this next is early ambulation and long term to time to research today majority of the centers have converted into the laparoscopic centers into daycare centers so answer is d which is highly incorrect in this case next is a 19 year old girl with six months uh, uh, with six months swelling moving with deglutition and muscle invasion remember swelling moving with deglutition there could be two things it could be a thyroglossal a thyroid swelling first is it could be a thyroid swelling or the second option it could be a thyroglossal duct thyroglossal duct but why will a thyroglossal duct present to you with features of muscle invasion so again one more thing is the thyroid swelling moves with deglutition with deglutition whereas a thyroglossal duct cyst will move with deglutition also and with protrusion of tongue so there is no comment on this so it's a thyroid and there is a muscle invasion so it's a cancer so try to understand amongst them amongst them what are the options that we have remember the invasive nature of medullary cancer is the maximum maximum in this case so c would have been better far better answer than a in this case it's a medullary ca because medullary ca is known for its dubious nature of local invasion also 
so C better than A. So D you have ruled out why? Because a thyroglossal duct cyst moves moves with deglutition, deglutition, and also with protrusion of the tongue. Second is it is benign, so there is no muscle invasion in this case. Same is the case with follicular adenoma. It will move. But there will be no feature of muscle invasion. Now, amongst A and C, medullary is more proper, you can say more uh, associated with the risk of invasion. Order of correction of hypospediasis. So, first thing that we do is the orthoplasty. Remember, 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 cordy correction. So, orthoplasty is what we do first. So, orthoplasty and then we are planning for then we are planning for the glanulo and the meatoplasty so orthoplasty glanuloplasty so it is the most important thing the first thing that we the first thing that you need to understand is we go for cordy correction so orthoplasty orthoplasty and then we go for glanuloplasty meatoplasty and urethroplasty so glanulo meato and the urethroplasty this is how we actually go for next is number of nodes removed in each cancer staging i think uh, uh, if there was a multi matching question matching type question breast you remove 10 stomach you remove 15 is the ideal count so 16 if it is was given colon is 12 and gallbladder anywhere more than 5 is justifiable so i don't know what was the question it was a match of following question type so this is the correct sequence of the answers Patient presented with hematuria. So, if you see here, there is a left renal mass with hematuria. What is the diagnosis? So, remember anything which is confidently observable on CT scan. Remember, it is only AML and AML because of the fat, because of the fat as the basic content can be confidently diagnosed, can be confidently diagnosed on the CT. So, if you see the fat ridden arrow marked, they are the fat ridden, uh, ridden lesions and that is why it is angiomyolipoma. I hope you know angiomyolipoma is tortuous blood vessels. Along with that, the fat, along with that, you have the, lip uh, you can say the smooth muscles. So, tortuous, tortuous blood vessels, angiomyo means muscle, smooth muscles and lipoma means fat. So next is which should not be given before splenectomy. So you know that before splenectomy you need a prophylactic prophylactic vaccination. Now when we talk about prophylactic vaccination, there are three vaccines which are standardly given two weeks prior. So two weeks prior to surgery we give H influenza, meningococcal, pneumococcal, typhoid vaccine has no role. Remember if it is done for elective. So this is for elective if you do it for emergency splenectomy, if you do emergency splenectomy, always remember, I have discussed a lot of times this concept in class, two, within two days, within two days, you will give the H influenza. So H influenza is given two days, within two days and after two weeks, after two weeks, you shall give the meningococcal and pneumococcal vaccines and this is what is very important, elective two weeks prior and emergency two weeks later except for the you can say hip hemophilus in, hemo influenza now gallbladder cancer there was a question that the early findings remember painless obstructive jaundice so painless obstructive jaundice and what is the reason for this obstructive jaundice it is nothing but the compression of the cbd so painless just a minute, okay so painless obstructive obstructive jaundice this is one thing that we have and then we have the palpable gallbladder mass. So palpable mass with painless obstructive jaundice. So jaundice better than B. Even there could be features of acute cholecystitis also. Acute cholecystitis like features can happen. So A is better answer. For safe resection of proximal transverse colon. This is again a very 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 simple question but very important question. So when we talk about transverse colon so let me draw this image and if you read if you go to my colon notes where i have discussed colectomies i have drawn the diagram in each case and shown it to you so when we talk about the proximal transverse colon so first thing that you need to know what should be the extent but before that this is superior mesenteric artery let me make a superior mesenteric artery trunk for you and out of which you have the major middle colic trunk middle colic 
and then this is the left branch of middle colic and this is the right branch of middle colic. Then you have the ileocolic, this is ileocolic and this is the right colic vessel. And then you have the IMA, inferior centric from which the left colic, the sigmoidal and the superior rectal branches are arising. So you are going for a proximal transverse colon tumor. So when you are talking about tumor or a proximal transverse colon for on I'm talking about tumor, it's a transverse colon, then you need to go right up to the splenic flexure. So you go for extended hemicolectomy, extended right hemicolectomy and that is the place where you need to ligate a lot of branches. So you ligate ileocolic also, right colic also and trunk. So if you see what you don't ligate, you will go for ileocolic ligation, trunk of middle colic, right middle colic, right branch of middle colic. Remember here the trunk of middle colic is the most important vessel. It is, what are the vessels that we ligate? Ileocolic also. Trunk of middle colic also, right colic also, but right branch of middle colic is not ligated. Why? Because we ligate the trunk. So what should be the answer in this case? B is not the vessel which we don't ligate, rather we directly ligate the trunk. So most common site for ileocecal TB, this is a very easy question for a country like India. TB is very, very, very important problem and we had seen a lot of questions in different sets. So it is IC junction, IC junction, stomach is a rare site, stomach is a rare site. So IC junction is the most common site, it's a throw forward question. Then you had a question on rat tail sign, string sign of Canton, football sign, inverted umbrella sign. So there are a lot of things. Now here the rat tail sign, you know, ecclesia. Okay, I understand it is more common in malignancy, but ecclesia would be the good answer for here. Football sign, you get to see in pneumoperitoneum. Inverted umbrella sign, you get to see in case of TB, ileocecal TB. Remember string sign you see in TB also, but here you can see in H pylo, uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis also. So this is what is the correct order for the match the following. Again, you know the triangle of safety. So you have pectoralis major, then you have the mid axillary line and then you have imaginary line towards the nipple areola complex. So obviously this is going to be pointing at the level of fifth intercostal space, at the level of fifth intercostal space. So this triangle that you can see, this is what is known as a triangle of safety. Now when you talk about, again a very simple question, a case of a clinical scenario given of a partial bowel obstruction, partial, remember, so surgery is not mandatory, weight loss, stricture in the bowel. So bowel obstruction, weight loss, stricture, very simple diagnosis is the inflammatory bowel disease or, or you can say in intestinal tuberculosis in a country like India. So I would have easily gone for a trial of ATT and if it would have not survived then only I would have gone for a stricturoplasty or maybe a resection. So this is what is very 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 simple and straightforward management in this case. Then my favorite topic there was a question direct forward on the sutures and I have discussed it lot of times many of the times you might have got irritated also but I know that they are, these questions will be asked. So polypropylene you know it's proline and proline is an ideal suture for hernia repair. Then we have polygalactin, polygalactin 910 and polydiaxone. So somewhere I think there is a controversy in the recall. Polygalactin is a suture which we preferred for bowel anastomosis. Even polydiaxone also can be preferred. Now someone has said skin closure. If skin closure is the answer, then there is no suture which is used here. Rather, if it is abdominal closure, then I would have gone for polydiaxone as an answer here. Remember, when we talk about nylon, nylon is a suture of choice for tendon repair. For tendon repair. I couldn't get the exact recall. So, whatever I have got, I have just written it. So, this is again, there was a question on CA prostate. A system maybe scan was done, which is showing uh, the uptake. Why this is known as a super scan? Because it is used to evaluate the metastatic spread. That is why system AB scan is a super span. I couldn't add the image because there was an image but I was not sure what it could be. So this is because of it is depicting the metastatic spread. That is why probably it is known as a super scan. Then there was a question on post appendicectomy on exploration there was some bleeding. So during appendicectomy, so what is the vessel that is very important? If you see my videos in this fold of treefs, in this fold of treefs, or here you will find the mesentery and in this mesentery, you will have the appendicular artery which is a branch of ileocolic artery. So it's a ileocolic artery or appendicular artery which is actually a part of this. 
so students this was a brief recall session i hope you enjoyed this and do don't uh, do take it as a positive motivation don't uh, you can say take it negatively that you could have done better and this and that you have the neat exam right forward press the gas pedal yes if you are able to make through that it's then it's great it's great if you're not able to need is still waiting for you where you have far better chances so even if you don't perform good in the nict that doesn't mean that you cannot be a topper in need pg so take your confidence to the level best that you can and do revise these questions do revise the questions of other subjects also take it as the hot running topics in the market and definitely you all will be able to be successful so thank you do subscribe to my channel do comment in the comment section how you liked or whether you want a recall video or whether you want a revision video on any other topic till then bye bye